So, let's continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Please open it up to chapter 25. Matthew 25. You know, this is a kind of a timely message. It's amazing to me as we go through the Bible, as we teach through the Bible, we, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and it's an amazing thing to see how the Holy Spirit just times things out perfectly. Things that might be very important for the moment uh, seem to always come to the forefront when we're, when we're studying His Word together. And this morning is no different. This is a, a message that is... Um, directed to you. It's a message that's directed to me, all of the believers in Jesus Christ, and knowing that perhaps we are living in a kind of, a, well, a perilous time, absolutely, but maybe a, a time of complacency, too. Uh, maybe a lot of the folks that uh, believe in Jesus are uh, kind of maybe a little bit lukewarm, maybe discouraged, and I know that... Uh, uh, this morning that the Lord has a message specifically for you. It's personal, and uh, so I'm blessed to be able to bring that to us this morning. I want to read to you from verse 14 down to verse 30, and then we're going to take a look at this and unpack it a little bit. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. He gave to one uh, five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and he brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came. He said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents, and look, I have gained two more talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then he who had received the one came and he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. And look, there you have what is yours but his Lord answered, and he said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given." And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable serpent, servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I think most of you are probably very familiar with this um, particular parable that we're looking at this morning. The parable of the talents. Um, and I want to approach this maybe in uh, two different angles this morning, if we can. The, the text itself, the context of our parable this morning, is he's talking about money. He's talking about finances. And they use the term talent on here, which was a coin, 
back in the, in the time of Jesus, and we'll take a little closer look at that in a second. But as we're going through here, I would like you to also use that word talent as you're listening for giftings, talents, music, whatever the talent might be, teaching, comforting, whatever it might be, intercessory prayer, whatever talents God has given us, the very same lesson applies this morning to those as what we see applying to a lesson concerning finances. So as we take a look at this, we first find out that uh, the uh, kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling. Now we've seen this phrase used over and over again. It never has said that the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling. It always, when he's given these parables, he's doing it as a comparison. So he says, this is what it's like in the kingdom of heaven. He did that when he talked about the children. Let the children come to me because there is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like these little children. And if you want to become a child of God, then you have to become like a child. Trusting in your Father in heaven with everything in your life, everything outside your life. You know, I think it's real easy to trust God when things are going normal, when I know what's coming. You know, there's some things that pop up in our lives that we are able to fix a lot of times. If we just, you know, we bear down, we get in there, we repair the broken things, and we, we work, and we do our best to make things right, a lot of times the problems in our lives can be solved in that way. But there are times in our lives where those issues that arise in our life, you can do nothing about it. Those are the times when it's difficult to trust. Because I think it's in our nature to want to get our hands in there. We want to get our tools out, and we want, to, we want to work on it and fix whatever it might be. I, I recall so many years ago, my, my oldest son, uh, when he was probably five years old, maybe, and uh, we had this little car back then in Arizona, and the thing would break down a lot, and I'm always turning wrenches on it and popping the hood in the heat of the desert day, you know, and it wasn't a whole lot of fun, but, you know, my, my oldest boy would come out, and, and I had bought him a little toolbox. It was plastic, and it had plastic wrenches and hammers and screwdrivers, and all the tools in it were plastic, right? They were pretend. They were toys, but he would bring those things out, and he would say, Daddy, I want to help you work on the car. And I would say, okay, and I'd pick him up, and I'd set him up on the wheel well there, and he'd break out his little plastic screwdriver, and he'd be doing his thing, you know, and I'm trying to work on it. And you know what? Sometimes it took me longer to fix the problem because I was dealing with this uh, fellow wanting to help me, and in trying to help me, it kind of prolonged the process. Um, but I never discouraged him from doing that. It was always a time for us to be together. It was a, a, a time of learning for him and me, of course. Uh, but sometimes I think that's what we do when we come to the Lord with our little plastic toolbox and we say, let me jump in there with you, Father, and help you fix this problem, you know. And he's like, oh, brother, not again, you know. <laughs> Could have had this done in a matter of minutes. Now it's going to take us all day long. But he's patient, isn't he? He works with us. He knows our weaknesses. He also knows our strengths. He knows our talents. And so this morning, I think it's really important as we look at this, that the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey. And this journey, of course, is referring us uh, to Jesus going on a journey. What journey did he take? Well, he left this earth. He ascended into heaven. That's where he is. That's where we're, we're waiting for his return. And uh, this story addresses that very directly. It's speaking of Jesus' ascension, if you will, and the time between his ascension and his return. It's a big window of time, about 2,000 years or so, a little more, and we're still waiting. But we're waiting with anticipation, and we're waiting with uh, hope that we know he is going to return just at the right time. And so as he goes for this 
journey that he says here. He entrusts his property, his investments, to his servants. And a lot of times these servants can be referred to uh, in many different ways. Manager, he, he's allowed them to manage his affairs. Uh, steward is another good word for this, a steward of God's gifts. Uh, an ambassador, Paul tells us that we are ambassadors uh, of Christ, that wherever we go, we represent him along with our gifts and all the things that he has blessed us with. And uh, there should not be a harboring of these things. We should let, let, allow them to work freely in our lives. Because they're not just for me. They're not just for you. They're for all of the people around you, whether they're in the church or out of the church. I know that this year has been kind of a cool year, kind of a crazy year when it comes to apples. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an abundance of apples everywhere. You know, I have a couple of apple trees, and I just can't keep up with them, how quickly they're falling down and trying to pick them and do something with them, you know. Um, but, you know, you're up there, and it's got, you know, maybe a, a thousand apples on this giant tree, and you're picking them, and you're thinking, you know, it only takes one apple to grow another tree. It only takes a seed out of that one apple for that tree to reproduce itself. How come there's so many apples What's that all about, right? Well, I really feel in my heart that maybe there's all those apples around there so that others can come and partake of them and be nourished by them, such as birds and stuff we see that happening in the late fall and early winter months where you may have fruit and it falls down the ground and, you know, by the end of the season, it's been eaten, it's gone. It's providing nourishment. It's, it's providing gifts to all those who are around it. And so a lot of times we may come to the Lord and we might say, you know what, all I've got is one apple. And he'll say, that's enough. That's a good place to start. You know, that's all you need to begin with is just that one faithful gift that God has given to you. I'm not an owner. You're not an owner of the gifts of God. As a matter of fact, Paul refers to you and I and himself as a bond slave. It's an interesting term. Slave, especially in the day that we're living in today with all the stuff that we hear going on out there. But Paul tells us that we're bond slaves to Jesus Christ. And that's a, that's a whole different scenario than being a, a slave owned by just a, some owner. A bond slave is a slave that has volunteered to be a slave. This is a slave that has put aside his ability to have freedom, and chose to become this servant to his master, a slave, a bond slave. You know, back in the day of Paul, there were only so many years that a slave would serve in a family, and maybe many times, as we see sometimes today when you have nannies and live in people that help with the kids, and they grow up with them, and they become attached to them, become part of the family, and then, you know, in 15 years, their contract's up, and, and you say, well, it was nice having you, and we love you, and we're going to miss you, and they say, I really don't want to go. Can I just stay, and, and I'll just work for free to be part of your family, and that, that was something that happened quite often during those times. Now, here's a funny thing, and I don't know, quite understand it, but in order to uh, sign at the bottom line, if you will, this desire to be um, a bond slave, they, they would take the person up to the door jam of the house, and they would take their earlobe and put it up against it, and they would drive a small nail in there, and they would pin his ear to the door jam. And you're thinking, that is really, really weird, right? But that was the way they did it. And by doing so, that person was indicating that they were going to remain attached to this family willingly, without being forced. Because, why? Well, because of the love that they had for that family. So you and I, this morning, we are called to be bond servants of the Lord. Willing slaves, if you will, of the Lord. And it's hard, I think, sometimes when we think about ownership. Have you dealt with that in your life? Ownership. Who owns your stuff? 
You know, that's a big thing these days. Who's the owner of my life? How do you view it? How do you see it? Do you see that everything that you have is a gift from God? Have we given the Lord full rights to our stuff? Lord, I can have stuff today. You can take it from me tomorrow, but I'm going to be just as content and trust you as I would did the day before when I had all the stuff. Now, I know that humanity kind of creeps in, doesn't it? <gasps> the bills are laid. I'm freaking out. I need that. Someone broke into my house. They took all my stuff. Whatever am I going to do, right? We get to a point as Christians, I believe, where we realize every single thing we have is a gift from God. Finances, homes, children, one another, talents, gifts that we might have. The Bible says every good and perfect gift, James tells us, comes down from the Father of lights. That's where it comes from. It comes from the Father of lights. And it's interesting because he says, where there is no shadow of turning. That's an interesting phrase right there. If you were to hold up a, a sphere, a globe up here on the stage, well, you would be seeing the light hit one side of it, but where the light's not hitting, there would be a shadow. But James is telling us with God, there is no shadow. It's all illuminated. And all of these gifts come from the Father of light. That's where we receive them from. Now, I know a lot of times I've prayed for gifts from God or I've had requests or maybe sometimes even demands. And looking back on it over the years, I have to tell you, I'm glad he did not give me what I was asking for. Right? You ever have that happen? Be careful what you ask for, right? So our story this morning is an interesting one because he gives these three men three different uh, amounts of currency uh, to work with. A talent. And uh, talents were interesting. If they were made of, uh, oh, silver, say, a silver talent, it could be worth up to $2,000. If it were a gold talent, it could be worth up to $25,000 back in those times. Now, if you consider that a man's daily wage during those times was about 15 cents a day, then five talents would have been a lot. It would have been like hitting the lottery or something like that, right? It would have been everything that you would need, and you would never have to worry about it again. So uh, the guy named Kenneth Taylor wrote in the Living Bible, this is how he rendered it. Matthew says that uh, Jesus gave one man uh, $5,000. He gave to another man $2,000. And then he gave to the third man $1,000. Now, he didn't give the guy five because he liked him better. He didn't give the guy one because he didn't like him as much. He gave these gifts to them according to what he already knew about them and to what he knew their abilities were to handle it. I love that. And it's very clear in the scripture here, that's what Jesus had done. He gives these gifts to each one according to his own ability. So when God gives you a gift, whether it's financial or whether it's something to involve with ministry or anything like that, he's never going to give you more than you can handle. So many people I've spoken to, and they say, oh, I could never do that. I'm not qualified for that. Let me tell you something. If God calls you, he'll qualify you, right? Right? And that's one of the most common things that hold people back, is that they'll say right away, oh, no, 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 I, I, I don't know where that's coming from, but boy, that's not me. I, I can't get up in front of people. And I'm really not a people person. I'm kind of a loner, and I just rather stay at home all the time and, you know, that kind of a thing. And he said, no, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you to step up. I'm calling you to put into action those gifts that you have. And so in the beginning, sometimes when you begin to use your gifts, you know, you may stumble and fumble around a little bit. You may go home thinking, boy, did I ever blow that, you know. Now I know for sure God didn't call me to that because, man, I did a horrible job. Well, let me tell you something. You get back up. You brush yourself off. 
and you look back into the fight again. And as time goes by, God refines us. He purifies us. He teaches us. We gain experience. And soon and very soon, those gifts are operating in our lives in a way that other people are being blessed by them. What gift, or should I say gifts, do you have? Do you know what your gifts are? There are many gifts listed in the Bible, the gifts of the Spirit. There's many different ways that people can be a gift to other people. You know, Paul was a good example of this. And I I think that in our lives, if we could have uh, approaching what Paul had in some way, you look at it and you think, first, Paul had Timothy. Now, and of course, you know, Timothy had Paul. But Paul had Timothy, who was his student, if you will. He mentored Timothy. He raised Timothy up as a young man to become a pastor. And when he went into ministry, he was still very young, and a lot of people kind of mocked him a little bit, saying, oh, he's just a kid. What does he know, right? But Paul worked with Timothy. He mentored Timothy. And I think as believers in Christ, that it's always healthy for us to have someone in our lives that we are mentoring, right? And then Paul also had a man named Barnabas. Barnabas was a really important fella. Barnabas, his name means the son of consolation. He was the encourager. He was the one who came up alongside Paul and said, man, Paul, I know things are tough, brother, but God's got his hand on your life. He's going to use you in a mighty way. Don't give up. Keep fighting the fight. So he had these two elements in his life. Well, I would like to think this morning that, you know, we could have all three of those elements in our lives. We could have someone to mentor, and we could have someone in our lives that bring comfort to us, but also I think that third element is really important, someone who we can look up to, someone who we learn from, someone who will teach us the things of God. To find someone in your life that maybe has been walking with the Lord has more knowledge or more experience, and you can, you can glean from that and grow. That's where Timothy had it so well, because he had the best mentor that there was in Paul uh, the Apostle. So having these gifts and having these gifts that differ from one another, as soon as he disperses these gifts, it tells us that he went on a journey. Now, we know that Jesus went on a journey. And... Uh, um, these gifts that he's given. Now, have you ever known anybody that like, maybe won the lottery or uh, somebody who maybe had a, a huge inheritance maybe given to them from their family or whatever, and then you see in a couple of years that they're broke, and they've lost everything, they've squandered it, they just pretty much spent it on riotous living and whatever they wanted to do. Uh, I knew a fellow like that that I used to work with, and, and uh, this guy lived in his car. He was very content to live in his car, but he won a big prize, I guess, at the casino, like $10,000. And you would think, good for him. Now he's going to be able to get a place and get his act together and, you know, have a good life. Within three months, it was gone. He'd blown it all up doing drugs and drinking and whatever, and three months later, there he is, sleeping in his car, broke, you know. And you think, what a shame. But again, I think a lot of people who have been given gifts, they squander them. They don't use them properly. They're not responsible stewards for what God has blessed them with. And why is that? Well, I think it's because their feelings about money don't line up with God's feelings about money. Sometimes money becomes bigger than God. It can become more important than God. And so people spend their whole lives pursuing it to try to think, someday I'll have enough. Has anybody ever had enough? I don't know if you can have enough. 
But I do know this, that whatever we do have, God expects us to be responsible with it. You know, especially when we have families or when we have children. Um, And we want to see ourselves as good stewards of the things that God has blessed us with. And I want to say this because I know that the Holy Spirit is given to you and I to guide us, to strengthen us, to counsel us. But above and beyond that, God kind of holds you and me responsible for what we do with the things he's blessed us with. He expects us to be faithful servants with what he has given us. There's a lot of people today who have wonderful gifts and talents that God has blessed them with, and they don't use them. And you know, if you don't pick that bunch of grapes and get it when it's ripe, it's just going to rot on the vine. And I, I think that's what happens with a lot of folks. God's blessed them with so much, and it rots on the vine. For whatever reason it might be, they're going to hoard them, they don't feel like they're good enough to share them, or whatever. You all heard the term sour grapes. Well, you know, I don't want to share my grapes because somebody might say, oh, it's just sour grapes, you know. God's saying, no, no, I want you to share the things that I have given to you as gifts, and, uh, which is a very important part of growing in Christ. That's part of the reason people don't grow. So he, yes, does he interfere? No. He lets you make your own choices. If you do come into some inheritance and you go out and you blow it, he's not going to stop you into the middle of that and say, oh, no, Bob, quit spending that money on that now. You know, I didn't give it to you to use for that. He's going to let you use it how you want. question is, how am I going to use it? How will I apply it to my life? Am I a hoarder? I'm not letting go of any of it. It's mine. It's all mine. Well, that's a good way to lose it all, isn't it? It's amazing to me the principle of giving, whether it be your God-given talents or your finances. The principle of giving is the same. The more you give, the more God blesses. You cannot outgive God. Remember that. It's real important. Now, some people come in here on Sundays, and, they, and they'll question me afterwards and say, wow, you know, Pastor, I noticed you guys don't, like, pass the plate. You don't beg for money in this church. I've never been in a church that doesn't beg for money, right? Why do we need to beg for money? My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the provider, isn't he? Where God guides, God provides. And it's not only in a church setting, but it's in your own personal life too. My goodness, I have been in places where you get wearied by the whole process of begging. We don't need to beg. Jesus never used that word. He said, ask and you'll receive, right? So I believe, you know, if God wants your life to prosper, he's going to provide for you the things in your life that will help you prosper if you manage them properly. I think the same principle applies with a church. If God wants the church to prosper, he's going to provide for the needs of the church without people having to squeeze each other, right? And we've seen that here for almost 15 years We have never, ever asked for a penny. And God has just abundantly blessed us without asking. That's a principle that that we hold to be very true um, as a church body here at Calvary Chapel. Now, one thing he does do when he gifts us with things is he gives us instructions. He gives us instructions in the word to show us how to properly cultivate and use those gifts that he's planted in you. You know, David said something very interesting. David said, wow, God, I understand that you knew me in my mother's womb. You knew me already in my mother's womb. You you knit me together. You made me who I am before I was ever even born. And you, you placed talents in there strengths, abilities to lead, 
David had those things from the womb. He was born into that. And he's still doing the same thing today with people. He's still doing it exactly like that. Before you were ever born, God knew you. He knew all about you. He already had a plan laid out. He said, look, I got this available, this available, this available, and I want you to grab those things and cultivate them and grow in them so that not only will you have a good life, but the people around you will be blessed as a result of that. That's the promise that he makes. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. Most of those promises are begin with the word if. If you keep my commandments, if you do not turn away, if you do not worship other gods, I will bless your land, I will bless your family, I will bless you. But if you choose not to, you will suffer the consequences of that. What a horrible thing to think that there could come a time in our lives where God might just kind of loosen his grip and we find ourselves floating downstream on a little tiny little raft that we've constructed, you know. And we might think, it's a nice warm summer day, I'm paddling, you know, Tom Sawyer kind of thing. And then you get to the white water and you get to the rapids and the thing starts falling apart. And you get washed up on the rocks, and there you are in ruin with nothing. Now, I would think maybe at that moment God would say, ha, ha, I told you so. Sorry, you missed the boat, so to speak. No, he doesn't do that. As we cry back out to him, we say, Lord, I've been a fool. I've been so foolish. I've rebelled against you. And he comes along, and he scoops us back up into his hand, and he starts over with us. What an awesome thing to know that. Aren't you glad that God will start over with you, that you have more than one shot at this? You know, a lot of people, a lot of states have this law that says three strikes and you're out. You commit three crimes and you go to prison for life. It's a long time for three crimes, Sometimes appropriate, sometimes maybe not. But that's not how God does it. God is always willing with outstretched arms to say, I know you stumbled, you fell, you're pretty scraped up, by the way. You got some scars that may never go away. But you know what? I love you just the same. I'm willing to help you get back on track again, get back on the right path. And I not only will put you on the right path, but I will navigate that path for you. I will lead you in that path because life does have a lot of twists and turns in it and we really need God's presence in our lives to help us to navigate these difficulties that life presents so the man leaves and he goes on a long trip he's been gone for 2,000 years (laughs) and during that 2,000 years he's blessed so many people with so many different things When it comes to finances, you can use money or you can lose money. You can squander it or you can be wise with it. And it's an interesting thing. Money sometimes is like water in your hands. It just flows through your fingers and you just can't stop it from going away. And pretty soon you're trying to grasp to the last little droplets of it and you don't have anything because you squandered it. You did not manage it properly. But when we invest in the things of God, we can see here by our story that these first two men, their profits doubled. Their increase was a 100% increase. And I got to tell you, that wasn't an overnight lottery win. That wasn't a one-time giant stock payoff. It was the long run. It took time. And sometimes we don't want to take time. We want it now. i got to find a way to get my return on it now. Well, sometimes that's not how it works with the Lord, whether it be finances or our own gifts. Lord, I want to be this in the church now. And he's saying, you're not ready. I'm still refining. I'm still chipping. I'm still forming and shaping you. So keep your clay soft so I can continue to do that. 
Keep that Holy Spirit water flowing on you so that you don't become dried up and I'm not able to work with you any longer. And be patient and allow the Lord to make us into the people. You know, Philipp- I think it's Philippians. He says, uh, uh, God will complete what he has started in us. He'll, he'll always finish the job in us that he began. We just need to be willing to let him do it. It's that simple. Have you failed trying to do that? Well, I think we all can say yes. I have failed in the past. But I also have to remember that this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's not a run. It's a walk. It's a walk with Christ. Sometimes we start off running Boy, we're so enthusiastic and on fire for Jesus, and we're sprinting down the road. And, you know, a lot of times people kind of start getting out of breath and winded and tired, and you see them down the road a little bit. I'm just exhausted, you know. Well, well, pace yourself. Let God do that work in you. Let Let your patience be placed in him as he does work for you. Anybody can make good choices for a day or a week or a month. But it's the long-term strategy that the Lord is looking at. It's the long-term of building good, long-lasting practices that bring success in our walk. But the third man in our story is different. The third man digs a hole. And he puts this coin in a hole and buries it. And I'm thinking right away, I'm thinking, now, why would you do that? Why, why wouldn't you just go out and spend it? Buy something with it. I mean, if you're not going to invest it, you might as well spend it. But this fellow doesn't do that. And if we look how he describes the Lord here in his uh, response to Jesus, it's almost as though he doesn't really have a very good uh, grip, if you will, on who Jesus is. Jesus is merciful, gracious, forgiving. He's very patient with you as he works with you throughout the years of life. He doesn't just give you a shot at it and if you don't make it, you're out. That's what this guy was afraid of. You know, this kind of shows me that maybe he never really did have a personal relationship with Jesus. Or he wouldn't have viewed him in this light. He would have known that he was safe with the Lord. He would have known that he would never be taken advantage of by the Lord. So rather than going and hiding your talent, God wants us to invest it and bring out more. So look what he says in verse 25. Oh, verse 24. He says, then he who had received the one talent, he came and he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. (laughs) You reap where you have not sown and you gather where you have not scattered seed. Well, I think maybe that perspective of God can be true from one angle. He can be a hard man. He does demand justice. He does demand accountability. But that's not the heart of Christ. It's opposite of that. It's a personal relationship. It's warmth. It's working with us as we develop these gifts. So he said in verse 25, I was afraid. There's a lot of people sitting in churches this morning that are afraid. There's a lot of people sitting in churches this morning who are saying, I know you're a hard man. And I'm scared to death to make a move because if I make it wrong, you're gonna, the hammer's going to come down. Does God have the power to do that? Well, absolutely. But is that truly his desire for our lives? To threaten us with the hammer all the time? No. No. Not at all. That hammer will only be used for those that don't believe. In the end, judgment will come. Accountability must be given. But we walk in grace. 
Paul said, we're saved by grace. Unmerited favor. We're saved by grace, how? Through faith. Through faith in what? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And the sacrifice that he made for us. Not by works. You see, that's the problem with works. When we get into works, we like our little peacock feathers to be up walking around going, look what I've done. I'm so special. God loves me so much. He's so lucky to have me on his team. Boy, oh boy, stand away from that child a little bit because there's a little humbling lesson that may be on the horizon there. You got to be careful with that one. We don't know how long the master was gone. We really don't. We know how long our master's been gone. And we eagerly await his appearing. We eagerly await that time when he will come and uh, uh, take us home to be with him. The second coming, if you will. And so after a long time, he will return. Now, one thing about uh, investments or gifts that you may have, spiritual gifts that you may have. I want to read one passage from you from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, It's verse 18 and 19. And it says, this is, what, this is kind of what we need in order to, to deal with these things properly, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, and that you would know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I love that. The word you is not in there except to acknowledge that I am looking at him for everything. It's not my power. It's not my enlightenment. It's not my understanding. It's been enlightened by God. Who, those of us who believe. And my goodness, you know, verse 19 is so cool because it could have said, by the greatness of his power, but that's not enough. By the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Super, 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 duper, duper power. Glad Paul used the word exceeding instead, right? So, God will come. He will settle the account with us. And, and look at the response he gets. And I love the, the response of these first two guys. They both have different amounts. They may have invested in different ways, but they both made good investments. They both did, they had discipline in their lives. They choose to follow God's map rather than their own. And when the day comes, the Lord says to both of them, well done. You're a good and faithful servant. I love that. Don't you want to hear those words someday? Don't we want to hear that when we stand before the Lord and he says, Tom, you're a good and faithful servant. And I'll just go, thank you, Lord. That's all I want to hear, right? You didn't hoard what I gave you. You didn't hide it in a hole. You made use of it, which is so very, very important. And what is my, what is my uh, blessing in all of this? Well, I've been faithful. You are being faithful over a few things. So I will make you the ruler over many things. And here's your reward. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That is the ultimate goal for every believer in here this morning, that we might enter the joy of the Lord. You know, it's interesting when you look at the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Of course, the fruit of the Spirit is capsulized in the word love. But then it has all these other descriptive words to describe what that means. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, self-control. These types of things that all emanate out from God's love. But it's interesting on the list that love... But the first one to describe it is joy. 
Why was it peace or patience or one of the other ones? Is it in a list that, is one, that, that, that stacks up? Yeah, it is. Joy. Enter into the peace of the Lord. No, enter in to the joy of the Lord. And by doing so, you will experience peace and patience. So when he comes, he will settle the account with his kids for sure. Um, of course, the man who did not have much of a good view concerning who the Lord was, he didn't come out of this very well. As a matter of fact, the Lord said, take that talent away from him and give it to that guy over there that's been investing so well. He'll make good use of it. You're just going to let it lay in the dirt. I'm going to take it from you. You know, here we have this unhappy picture of perhaps we might say a religious person. Well, I took it. I buried it. I know God's angry at the whole world. I'm scared to death of him. But boy, I'm going to be trying to do my best to earn my way in there. And they're going to find out in the end that's not who God was at all. You know, some people might say, oh, I know my pastor. He is such a mean guy. He's so controlling. He's got his fingers in everything. He won't let me do anything without breathing down my neck. You know, you guys know me. You know that I'm totally the opposite of that. I'm letting you be free. I want you to use your gifts. But you could see me in the wrong light. You could picture me in the wrong light, and, you, and we can do that to one another. And that affects our personal relationships. So if I'm picturing God in the wrong light, it's going to affect my relationship with him. It's going to lead me down a, a cold path, a judgmental path. Now over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the first two verses, I want to read those to you. Paul is saying this. He said, let a man so consider us as the servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So the master in the story is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's true. These charges reflect what you know about the Lord. Either he does not understand the character of his master, or he's just attempting to justify himself by placing the blame somewhere else. That's kind of irresponsible. It's kind of dishonest. And people respond that way sometimes when they're confronted with their own shortcomings. They can blame others. I'm not a great musician, but, you know, there are times when I've... <clears throat> played music here at the church and did worship and things like that, and I never really felt like that was my gig, if you will. Um, but, but, you know, I enjoyed doing it, although I was scared to death every time I would do it. And I remember one evening playing worship over at a different church, and there was not maybe 10 people in there. And I'm sweating bullets, and my face looks like it's going to pop. And I can't make a chord to save my life. And I felt so humiliated when it was over. And I walked up to the pastor and I said, oh, man, I am so sorry. He looks at me and he said, what are you sorry for? And I said, that was terrible. How can people worship with that kind of racket going on, right? And I said to him, I said, well, I guess God was just giving me some humble pie. And he looks down at me and he says, yeah, but it's too bad he did it at the expense of everybody else. Are you kidding me? Did you really say that to me? I'm never coming back here again. I'm out of here. I'll never play my guitar again. Well, six days later, I was back in there playing my guitar again. But sometimes that kind of thing happens to us. We get humbled. Does that mean we give up? We run away? We go and we hide our head in the hole? No, not at all. It means you get up and you brush yourself off and you continue to work on it. So this guy buries 
his gift. And it's taken from him in the end. And this is the master's reply to the servant. You wicked, lazy servant. Ouch. That hurts. He judges this man as wicked and lazy. What does it mean to be wicked? Well, it means to be serving the evil one, if you want to get right down to it. It means to be living along the same lines as the evil one would, which is always confined and trapped and cold and stiff and open for failure, never the ability to grow and be molded from a biblical perspective when one habitually practices sin, it's wickedness. Now, I know that all of us in here once in a while, we, we trip, we fall, we make mistakes. But when we do, we understand that I need to come before the Lord, I need to repent, and that doesn't mean just to say, you know, I'm really sorry I got caught doing that, Lord. It means to say, I'm sorry I, got, I did that, Lord, and now I'm going to change the direction of my path. I'm not just going to sit here and mope over it. I'm going to change what direction I'm going. That's what true repentance is. You know, when 9-11 happened many years ago, and a lot of you remember that, the church attendance really blew up. But, but repentance of our nation never happened. And it wasn't just a couple of months before the people who came out of fear were gone and everything was kind of back to normal again, you know. That's kind of how it works sometimes. But this poor uh, servant who was afraid of the Lord, um, this is what the Living Bible says that he responded by saying, uh, since you knew I would demand your profit. You should have at least put my money into the bank so that I could have some interest. The worst thing in the world you can do is bury it. And then he does this. He says something to him that's actually quite shocking. He says, uh, cast that unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not a pleasant place to go. But I'll tell you something, for sure I know this, not one child of God will be there. Not one true believer in Jesus will be in that place. We've been delivered from that place. Obviously, this man did not know the Lord. If you're born again in here this morning, last thing in the world you got to worry about is hell. Right? Right? We are all members of one another, and I'm going to close with this. When we have the worship team, please come back up. We are to work together. We're to use our energies and our gifts and whatever they might be to further God's kingdom. So in Romans chapter 12, I want to close with this verse. Romans chapter 12, 4 through 8 says this. For as we have many members in one body... But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, then let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. And he who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I love that. Paul said, you know what? We are all interconnected together. Now, one of the greatest things that people think when they think about gifts, maybe they'll think, well, it's the guy that's up front, right? Not true. Sometimes it's the big toe in the body that's the most important. You ever know anybody that didn't have a big toe? 
Huh? I used to know a guy, Toeless Joe. He lost his toes because a pig stepped on his feet and crushed his big toe. And the man did not have any balance at all. He was constantly rocking back and forth. The big toe supplies stability in our lives. Not the prettiest thing on our body, but very, very important. So whatever your place, whether it's a big toe or a mouthpiece or your hands or whatever it might be, just know that they're all equally important. They're all equally needed. And I want to encourage you guys this morning, use them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for these gifts that you've given us. And Lord, help us and teach us to be wise with them. Lord, to invest them in the things of the kingdom where there are no thieves, there's no corruption, there's no moth or rust. It's a good investment. And you've created us for that very purpose, Lord. You have placed us in this world at this time for a specific reason. Help us, God, to discover that reason and that purpose and fulfill our lives with it. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your guidance, your instruction, your wisdom, and your power. Help us, Lord, because we are weak, and we need you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.